Welcome to the midweek service. Take a songbook. We're going to sing together, and it's going to be 327, 327. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, drinking at the springs of living water. 327 in your songbook. Once you have it, let's stand together. And when you stand, Brother Bible, lead us. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, and nothing satisfying there I found. But to the blessed cross of Christ one day I came, where springs of living water did abound. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water, oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. How sweet the living water from the hills of God. It makes me glad and happy all the way. Now glory, grace, and blessing mark the path I've trod. I'm shouting hallelujah every day. Drinking at the springs of living water. Happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water. Oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Oh, sinner, won't you come today to Calvary? A fountain there is flowing deep and wide. The Savior now invites you to the water free, where thirsting spirits can be satisfied. I'm drinking at the springs of living water. Happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water. Oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Amen. Good singing tonight. Good to see you in church, and uh, man, we've had a wonderful week, haven't we? Uh, get a chance to come out, many of you did, Monday night and Tuesday night, and help put the John and Romans together that you see up here, and uh, knocked out 6,000 really quick, and uh, I told Brother Taylor next time we might as well go for 10, amen? Uh, four of us think we should. Uh, next time, I think we ought to go for 10, amen? Uh, I mean, we, we could have... We, we knocked off early Monday night, and uh, it was really, we could have been done by seven last night and just did a few extra uh, generic ones, so to speak, just not one of our covers, just a regular cover that BPS uses, and uh, thank you so much for everybody who came out. I think we had right around 40 Monday night. We had 50 last night, and uh, that's a total of 90 people in the two nights there that are uh, putting together the Word of God. That's exciting. And tonight, we'll dedicate these scriptures and Ask God to bless them and uh, use them in the lives of people as they go go forth. I've never been part of a dedication service after putting scriptures together. Uh, I think maybe just a couple in this room might have been a part of that, and uh, most of us have not. Is that am I right about that? And uh, so I'm looking forward to it, and uh, glad you're here this evening. Glad I'm here this evening, and looking forward to what God has for us. All right, let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the wonderful privilege it's ours to gather together here this evening uh, lord we pray that you'll in a special way meet with us this evening lord give us uh, make this service just exactly what you would want it to be and you, what you know that we need it to be and lord we thank you for the privilege that's been ours to assemble the word of god uh, these last couple nights and lord it's a it's a wonderful privilege and yet lord we realize it is the local church's responsibility and we thank you for raising up the ministry uh, of First Baptist Church of Milford. And uh, Lord, that have taken upon their heart and, and you have provided for them in miraculous ways to be able to print and publish the Word of God. And Lord, we're thankful that we can have a part in that. And I pray your blessing on our service now this evening. Uh, Lord, bless in the music and the fellowship together. Uh, be with Brother Taylor as he brings the message to us from your Word tonight. Uh, may you be pleased with what goes on in this place this evening. It's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. All right, you may be seated. 287 in your hymnal, 287. If you from sin are longing to be free, let's sing that first together. If you from sin are longing to be free, look to the Lamb of God. He to redeem you died on Calvary. 
missionary tonight is brother taylor and his wife and uh, they're here with us and i'm going to have him update us uh, when he comes up to bring the message he'll spend a few moments and kind of bring you up to date about where they've been and uh, what they've been up to recently and so he'll do that right before he brings the message for us this evening so go ahead and get your prayer guide out if you would and uh, get that ready to go our coming events of course we have the ru inside tomorrow night uh, down at the crc prison and uh, friday night right here uh, Reformers Unanimous, and then, of course, Saturday morning out at London, and our soul winning bus visitation at 10 a.m., and then Sunday will be 61 years, 61-year anniversary. We'll have a wonderful service here in the morning, and then uh, dinner afterwards out in the Fellowship Hall. The sign-up sheet is down there. Please sign up for that and uh, let us know what you're bringing. What we, we look at that list and kind of gauge what's coming. Uh, I think right now we have two main dishes and two, dis two uh, side dishes. Everybody else is having cake and Coke. <laughs> okay? So uh, maybe we ought to balance that out a little bit. What do you think? All right? So uh, help us out there. Sign up there and bring something in on Sunday. All right? We'll have a great time together. And then Sunday evening, uh, Brother Dean Kirshner will be with us. And Brother Kirshner does a tremendous dramatic presentation of a Russian soldier and who remained faithful to God and was persecuted for it. And it's, a, it's really a stirring story. And uh, you're going to enjoy that on Sunday evening. Don't miss out. You'll, you'll be sad if you do. And uh, you're going to enjoy him on Sunday evening at 6.30 uh, in the evening service. All right. On the inside <coughs> of the list, can we praise the Lord? We had 18 at CRC last Thursday with two new guys and six received Christ as their Savior. And then uh, 20 at London on Saturday and two new ones there and one that was saved. And uh, God's doing great things there in the RU Inside ministry. Continue to... Uh, pray for the different church ministries and, of course, these on our health list that uh, need our prayers. Uh, we pray for those in authority, uh, as we ought to, and I hope you're praying for the leadership and for the upcoming election in our country. Uh, continue to pray for these serving the military and serving our country in the military. Uh, pray for those on the cancer list and those battling uh, that disease and then of course these on the salvation list um, we pray for their salvation and pray that God will bring a soul winner across their path and someone who they'll listen to and and will be bold enough to give them the gospel and we'll see them come to know Christ and we pray for the unreached people groups of the world and we continue to uh, lift these folks up in prayer and uh, many many folks who have never been reached with the gospel of Christ and many of them have never heard of Jesus Christ, and many of them certainly don't have any Bible uh, to be able to, to, to read or to look at in their own language. And then, of course, our missionaries tonight, uh, highlighted by the Taylors working with BPS uh, Seedline. All right, and uh, let's uh, go to prayer tonight. I want Brother Wallace to come and lead us in our prayer this evening, and as uh, Brother Wallace leads us audibly, I want you to pray along with him silently, if you would. That's how you unite your heart together in prayer. Don't just let your mind wander or think, well, let's see, I can get about a seven-minute nap or something like that in, all right? Uh, as he prays for something, you just kind of pray right along with him, okay? And let's unite our hearts together in prayer. 
Brother Wallace. Let us pray. Father, we want to thank you for uh, your love and your grace. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to, to be a servant for you this week and of allowing uh, many of us to come out and uh, fold these uh, leaflets that we're going to hand out, these John and Romans. And Lord, I just uh, want to thank you for the, the privilege. And, and uh, Lord, uh, it, you just can't explain uh, what, a, what a wonderful, uh, it's more than a feeling. It's, it's, it's a wonderful uh, peace uh, and a joy and a contentment that you have when you're serving the Lord. And you know that after you get that, your part done, the Lord has made great promises that uh, these, uh, his word will not come back void. That everything that is handled, everything that is handed out, as we were folding and getting ready last night and, and make, preparing these for Monday and Tuesday, we, Lord, I'm uh, sitting there thinking about, you know, each and every fingerprint that has touched these um, John and Romans. Uh, you know our hearts when we were working you could go by and tell whatever heart was thinking as they were doing your work and uh, lord uh, that that is going to be blessed by you i'm sure of that because your word says it will and lord i just want to thank you again for being such a great god knowing that lord uh, the work's not done and you will finish it you will uh, put these into the hands and and uh, you will uh, touch every heart that receive these books these John and Romans and Lord I just want to thank you again for uh, being a part of that by having our church be a part of it and Lord uh, we can't thank you enough looking forward to seeing great testimonies come from uh, the work that uh, we put in last night and Monday night Father thank you again for uh, just uh, being a, such a great God Lord I do pray for our, our missionaries and uh, especially uh, uh, brother taylor and his wife as they travel many many miles during the year and and uh, lord uh, do your work i pray that you'll give them safety give them uh, good health uh, lord uh, uh, he's told uh, wonderful stories of of uh, what uh, has been brought forth in some of the work of handing these books out and lord that just goes to increase our faith that uh, no matter uh, what, where these books go, uh, they're in your hands. And Lord, you got full control. And uh, we just know that that's, uh, that's uh, going to be beneficial to someone out there to call upon you and become your child and spend eternity with you. Father, I want to pray for the unreached groups that we have on our prayer list. And, and uh, Lord, I just, uh, uh, there's just so many that have not yet received your word. And, and Father, I just pray that you would uh, keep us on the direct path, the, the sure path that you would want us to go and continue to talk to our pastor's heart that we're going the, the way that you would want us to go. And, and Lord, uh, doing the things that you would want us to do, that we would be in your will always and not get off, not get, go astray, but to be in your will. Father, I pray for us. Uh, the ones who are sick and the ones who are on the cancer list. I pray for uh, Sister Steltner that she's still in the hospital. Hopefully she will come home soon. I pray for her continue, continue to, uh, uh, her health to continue to get better. And Lord, uh, I, I pray that you will use her to be a good testimony to people around her. Keep her spirits up, keep her joy up, that uh, Lord, she can be a, a good testimony to those uh, doctors and nurses that she's around. Father, I pray for her son, that Richard, that this would uh, get him to thinking. And uh, Lord, uh, that you would impress upon his heart that eternity's coming one day. And Lord, I just uh, want to thank you for the work you're going to do there. And Father, now as we uh, continue our service, Lord, uh, I just pray that each and every heart will be open to uh, what uh, is going to be preached from your word. Lord, always looking forward to learning and to hearing uh, what you would want us to hear. But Father, uh, there's no one in here that knows everybody's heart, what everybody needs. The Holy Spirit we depend on to go down each and every row and to prick each heart and to give each heart what they need to mature 
and become better Christians, that we, you would shine through us, that it would draw men to us, that we could tell them about your son Jesus. Lord, we want to thank you for everything that's going to be said and done in the rest of the service. May everything that is done be for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Wallace. Appreciate that. Um, Brother Phil, you have a young couple with you tonight. Why don't you introduce them to everybody? You want to do that right now for us? And that's great. That's great. Tyler and Shannon, good to have you with us tonight. That's great. Glad you came up for the trip, and uh, that's exciting news. And, uh, boy, newlywed, newlywed. Uh, they just barely fresh off the honeymoon, man. Well, you're still on the honeymoon, amen. Yeah. But uh, just uh, good, uh, good to have you along tonight, okay? Anyone else this evening visiting? Don't think I've seen most familiar faces here tonight. Okay. Let's give this young couple a warm welcome, shall we? Take your songbook. Let's sing again together, shall we? 243, I am resolved no longer to linger. 243, let's stand together and sing, shall we? I am resolved no longer to linger by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have a look. third i am resolved to follow the savior faithful and true each day heed what he saith do what he willeth he is a living way i will hasten to him a sense of glad and free jesus greatest highest I will come to thee. Amen. Greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together. I 
I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Let's all sing that last together when we get to the chorus. We'll uh, have the instruments drop out. We'll sing that a cappella on that last. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Everybody said? Amen. Be seated, if you will. Time for our offering now tonight. Everybody said? Amen. Oh, that's a little weaker, but I'll take it. And uh, the um, offering tonight is going to go to Brother Taylor. Uh, they come up and do the seed line ministry and he doesn't ask a dime for it. He asked several hundred dollars, but no, he didn't ask a dime. Uh, didn't come with any, you know, any requirements or anything like that from us. Just uh, to come to, to bring all the material and bring everything up and set it up. And let's be a blessing to them, all right? They come by faith, trusting that God will take care of their needs. And uh, God will do that through us, all right? And so uh, let's be generous in the night. You always have been, and I trust you will be this evening as well. All right, let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for the privilege that's ours to give to the servants of God who you bring our way. And Lord, I pray will be a blessing to Brother Phil and Sarah. I have no idea what their needs are, but you know what they are. And Lord, I, I pray that this offering tonight would be not only something that would meet their needs, but would go even far and above that, Lord, and maybe take care of something that they would like to have or they'd like to do. And this offering would enable them to do that. So help us to give generously tonight, Lord. And thank you again for the ministry you've given to them and for the privilege we had to be a part of it this week. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Well, let's see. Brother Bob, when was Brother Taylor here for the missions conference? You were looking at pictures the other day, and you were telling me about it. Remember what year that was? Was that 12, or was it 11? 12, all right. We were talking. We thought it was four years ago that they came, and he preached our missions conference for us, and I think that was the year we took them on uh, as our missionaries and uh, been supporting them now for four years. And I'm excited we, we finally got this together. We talked about it before, and we weren't able to do it at that time, but the Lord made this time the right time, and uh, they just got back from uh, Rio de Janeiro. They were passing out the John and Romans down in Rio at the Olympic Games. <clears throat> some of you, if you have Facebook, you might have seen some of their live updates that they had. He's going to tell you a little bit about that and then uh, share anything else the Lord wants him to update us uh, on, and then he'll open the Word of God to us tonight. Brother Taylor, you come. Thank you, Pastor. I think I'm on here. There we go. Certainly thankful to be back here at Bible Baptist Church and thankful for uh, 
the church here for this ministry, and you know tonight we'll give a report for what the Lord's done uh, uh, in our lives and our ministry over the last several years since we've been here last. And it's always encouraging to come back and to report to a church and to let them know uh, what God's doing in our ministry because we want you guys to understand that it would not be possible if it wasn't for churches like yours who would get involved, who would support us on a monthly basis, that would support the ministry. And we certainly thank you for your support, uh, faithful support of our family. The Lord's done a lot since we were here last year. I remember when I first met Pastor Slayball, I was driving uh, the bus, me and my brother, down to El Paso, Texas, just a short drive down there on the bus, uh, not very long with great air conditioning that works terrifically and never any problems or issues or anything like that. And uh, it's uh, certainly some fond memories. I was thinking of some of those just the other day. And then uh, when I walked in the back and saw the names of the missionaries in uh, the conference we were able to be a part of here will be a uh, memory for us always of one of the greatest conferences we've ever had the opportunity uh, to be a part of in the way that your church blessed us and uh, gave and was, uh, went above and beyond. Don't take that for granted. You know, the... The temptation when you're in a church like this that has so much going on and is so involved in missions and loves the Word of God and loves missionaries and treats them right and, and, and goes above and beyond is the, that the expectation maybe that is that you get used to it. Or this, this is the way that it is everywhere. Can I tell you it's not the way that it is everywhere? You should be thankful that you're a part of a church that has a love for missions and missionaries. And can I tell you, the missionaries that you have the opportunity and the Lord's allowed you to support are thankful for that. And we appreciate it so very much. I, I can't even begin to tell you all the things that the Lord has done in our lives since the last time we were here, but I'm going to give it a shot uh, to hit some of the highlights that have happened in the last couple of years. Uh, many of you have probably noticed that we, our family has grown by 50% since last time we were here. Me and Sarah have been married for about nine years and uh, went through a very difficult time when I, uh, uh, we were actually down in Georgia and I had noticed some things, some changes in my body and when that transpired I, I, I thought immediately that I should definitely uh, go to the doctor and I did go to the doctor and uh, the doctor, he said, uh, he said, uh, Mr. Taylor, he said, I need you to go to a specialist right away. And so I went to this specialist, and they did a, uh, uh, they did a scan of sorts on me, and uh, they said um, uh, they needed to send me to another specialist who would read those. This was all happening in one day. I was getting a little nervous at this point, and you know, when you're 33 years old, uh, at that time, you don't expect to go into the doctor and that day find out that you have cancer. Uh, but that day I found out that I had uh, pure seminoma cancer. And it was a trial. It was a difficulty. It was a struggle because of the nature of that particular cancer. Uh, the doctor said, we want to do surgery right away to remove uh, the tumor that you have. Uh, they ran some tests on me and they told us, you know, my wife and I, uh, we had never been able to have any children and we had always just trusted that that's what the Lord had for us and that if he wanted us to have children, then that he would provide in that way, and we trusted him with that. But the doctors told us that day, after running all the tests, uh, they said, this cancer is the reason that you cannot have children, and he said, you'll never be able to have any children. And you know what? Honestly, we accepted that as what the Lord had for us. We had always said, if the Lord doesn't want us to have any children, then we don't want to have any children. We want to follow what God has for our lives. And he said we wouldn't be able to have any. And the, we didn't know it at the time. And the doctor didn't know it at the time. Now, we've been married for almost nine years at that time. And we weren't aware, and the doctor wasn't aware, but the Lord had already given us a child as the doctor was speaking those words that we could not have any children. And uh, well, some would say, well, the doctor was wrong and all those things. I don't know, but I believe that God reached down and he performed a miracle in our lives and gave us... Hudson Taylor was born on April the 15th, tax day. Uh, we'll never be able to forget him. Our little tax break was born on tax day. So that was a blessing, and I tell you, the Lord knows exactly what you need when you need it. He knew that during that time and that trial of going through cancer that the 
blessing that he would give us during that time would be worth the amount of time uh, that he asked us to wait to do that and perform that miracle in our lives. And what a blessing it's been. Hudson is now 16 months old. Uh, if you have any parenting questions, uh, feel free to come and see my wife afterwards, me and, and her. We've got 16 months of experience now, so we pretty much know everything about parenting. We'd be glad to give you some tips, some things that might be a help to you. The truth of the matter is we do not have a clue uh, about being parents. Uh, but I'll tell you this much, we're giving it a shot. Uh, and uh, with the Lord's help, we want to raise a son that's going to honor the Lord with his life. A lot of people have said, did you, do you know that Hudson Taylor, that the name Hudson Taylor, that he was a famous missionary? And he said, well, yes, absolutely, we knew that. <laughs> and other people will say, well, that's a lot of pressure to put on him, to name him after a famous missionary and you know what, we don't want to put any pressure on him. We just want him to serve God with his life, with no matter what God has for him. Now, we'd love for God to make him into a preacher or a missionary, but we know this, whatever he does, our goal is to raise a young man that would affect his generation for the cause of Christ and make a difference in this world, no matter what God has for him. And uh, we're excited and uh, uh, looking forward to the next, you know, I, I might be, uh, you know, at his uh, high school graduation or his, uh, his marriage, I don't know, uh, coming down on a walker or a wheelchair or something, I'm not sure uh, the, uh, why the Lord made us wait, uh, wait so long some days. Uh, although I'm still young, it's a little harder than if I'd have been uh, uh, younger to uh, keep up with him. But uh, uh, the uh, blessing the Lord gave me uh, in Sarah, and well, the other blessing is he gave me a young wife, so uh, she's able to keep up with him and chase him around all the time. But uh, we certainly are thankful for that miracle that the Lord's done in our lives in uh, giving us Hudson and what a joy that is. And uh, the ministry, he's done a lot of wonderful things. I want to share just a couple. Uh, one opportunity he's given uh, us uh, last, uh, last about, well, actually it was about two and a half years ago I had a missionary call me. And he said, Brother Taylor, I heard you're the guy to call if you need Bibles. And I said, well, we certainly can help you if you need some Bibles. He said, I'm a missionary in the country of Sierra Leone. Now, Sierra Leone is a country that's in the western horn of Africa. It is about 80% uh, Muslim. And he said, what's transpiring there is the, the, the uh, president of the country has given me the authority to do the training of all the chaplains in their military. And he said that, They've given him the opportunity to give a Bible to every member of the active duty military in their entire country. He said, do you think that you could come up with those Bibles? I said, well, absolutely. And I said, well, what do you want them to look like? And he said, well, what do you mean? He's like, I thought you just have regular Bibles. And I said, we do, but if you want, we could make something special, you know, for the military there. And so what we did is we made a nice camouflage cover that has the insignia of their military on the front of it. And we loaded all those up into a sea container. And they were, well, we had them in the warehouse. We're getting ready to load them into a sea container. And if you're aware of what's been happening in West Africa, uh, as uh, about a year to two years ago uh, was the, um, it slipped, uh, the Ebola crisis uh, had come to that part of Africa. And Sierra Leone was one of the countries that was worst, uh, the worst stricken by this disease of Ebola. And we couldn't get the Bibles in. And we were kind of devastated by that. Well, about a year later, this was last summer, I got a call from the missionary, and he said, we're ready to receive the Bibles. He said, the Ebola crisis is not over, but he said, it's calmed down quite a bit. He's like, could you send the container of Bibles, and the president would like for you to come and present them to our military. And then he said, he asked me another question. He said, do you think you could bring a Bible for the president? I said, I think that I could do that. He said, do you think you could bring a Bible for the vice president? I said, I, I think that I can do that. I said, is there anybody else you would like to have a Bible there? <laughs> and being a good missionary, he sent me a very extensive list of people that he would like to have a Bible. And so uh, we took some, one of our nice leather-bound Bibles and had the president's name put on it, was able to present that to him while we were there, uh, was able to present one to the vice president, the secretary of defense, uh, uh, many, many people, the head imam over all of the Muslims in their military, we put his name on a Bible and gave it to him. Somebody said, isn't that just a waste of a Bible? I couldn't think of a better place to send one. 
than to give unto the head imam of Sierra Leone. Maybe he'll accept Christ and be gloriously saved. And uh, We don't know what the Lord's going to do with those scriptures, but I tell you this, when I got there, I saw a people whose country had been stricken by a terrible disease and whose hearts were open to allowing God to do something in their lives and in their nation. We drove, when we pulled up to our hotel when we first got there, it's a third world country, so poor, there's only about one hotel in the entire country that you could actually stay in safely as an American. That's where we stayed. When we pulled up, as soon as we got there, there was a vehicle outside, and it said Ebola Response Team from the CDC right out in front of our hotel. We would drive through these little villages, and maybe on Fox News, because I know none of you watch CNN, but on Fox News, you would see on there... Uh, maybe they would show one of these Ebola camps where they would send these people to, to uh, put them in isolation. We'd drive down the road and you would see them. And they'd be clearly labeled. And you'd come into this little town and there would be two men standing where you would enter this little village and they'd be holding a rope. Like the rope was going to do anything. I don't know what the rope was going to do. But they would make you stop and they would take your temperature and you'd have to wash your hands to make sure that somebody was not coming in to their little city or to their little village that had Ebola. Uh, when we got back, they actually, the CDC took us out of line while we were there. And for 21 days, we had to report to the CDC here in the United States of America for two days, or for, uh, for two days, twice a day for 21 days. And they had to take our temperature and make sure that we didn't, we weren't sick or we weren't having any of the symptoms of Ebola. Uh, so here we have a country whose entire military on December the 25th of 2015, every member of their military got a Bible, most of them for the very first time. On top of that, while I was there, they allowed me to be able, Pastor, to preach a spiritual enrichment course and leadership course for a week long while we were there to some of their new military recruits. Many of them, over 20, accepted Christ while we were there. And um, we had, when I got there, they gave me a police escort every place I went. They gave me a bodyguard that was with me. I wish I could show you the picture of my bodyguard, Silvanos. And Silvanos was our bodyguard, and he would sit in the lobby of the hotel until we were going somewhere, and then he would go and get our entourage of police vehicles, and they would take us wherever we wanted to go and do whatever we wanted to do while we were there. The traffic was so bad, they would actually drive the opposite way against traffic and make everybody move out of the way so that they could get us where we were going. So we, I told the guy who was with me, I said, I sure hope they don't find out who I really am or they're really going to be disappointed. I think they thought they booked Billy Graham or somebody like that. I'm not sure. But what a, uh, what a blessing. Their hearts were open spiritually. Many accepted Christ. Our bodyguard who was with us, of course, he had to be there the whole time, and he would sit there while I was teaching. And at the end, we gave out diplomas for everybody. And uh, he had been in all the classes, and we, so we made a, uh, a certificate. He asked if he could, since he was in all the classes, if he could get a diploma that he graduated from this course. And so, we, of course, we gave him one. But while I was there, the head of the National Police Force came to me, and they're very competitive between the National Police Force and the military. And he saw those Bibles, and he came to me, and he said, uh, he said, Mr. Taylor, he said, uh, I'm embarrassed to ask this, he said, but is it possible that we could get Bibles like that for all of our National Police Force? So we have now printed special Bibles for the entire National Police Force for the entire country. In October, I'll be going back again. I'll be teaching again for another week some spiritual enrichment for the new police recruits that are coming in. Um, and the Lord is opening up doors. I can tell you this, we've seen doors open before. When the curtain of communism fell, in Russia, the door was open for a period of time. But if you're watching the news, guess what? The window of opportunity is drawing closed. The hearts of the people and the government of Sierra Leone are open right now. And I believe firmly that we must act while the opportunity is there because we don't know how long the opportunity is going to be available. And so our desire is to get as many scriptures as we can into the country of Sierra Leone. Pray. I'll be there at the end of October, first week of November, and then actually I'll be going down into, I was talking to another guy today, into prayerfully into Togo, Benin, and Burkina Faso to be able to uh, work with the national pastors and do some training with the national pastors in those three countries as well. So we'll be able to go to four countries, work with national pastors in all those areas. Pray 
about that the uh, expenses for that are going to be almost $4,000 for us, uh, for just me to be able to go for the flights and everything that's going to take. And uh, we do all that by faith, and we trust the Lord that He's going to provide. And that's one thing you could pray for, uh, pray for me about would be the finances of that trip of the Lord. Uh, would provide that so that we could see that come to pass. There's a lot of visas, paperwork, airline tickets, all those kinds of things uh, that have got to transpire. So pray that the Lord would allow that uh, to come to pass and we would see those finances come in. We just recently came back from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And anybody who is alive right now knows that the Olympics are going on in Rio de Janeiro. And I can tell you this, don't believe, I know this is going to shock you. Pastor Slayball, don't be shocked when I tell you this, okay? But this is going to be hard for you to take because I know you put a lot of trust in these people. Don't believe everything that the media tells you, okay? I know that's hard to believe. But the media really is not in the business of reporting the news. They're in the business a lot of times of making news and making stories. And uh, the country of Brazil and the city of Rio, uh, if it, it does have its issues like any other place does, but a beautiful city. Uh, did a great job of hosting the people who were there. The Olympics will close this week. But here's something great. You know what? A lot of athletes were there performing to represent their country. But we were there representing the King of Kings and representing a greater cause than anything that was transpiring there at the Olympics. We printed and sent 400,000 scriptures to Brazil, 180,000 plus of those were for the Olympics, had a special cover for the Olympics. The week I was there, we saw over 110,000 of those go out. Uh, the team who was coming in behind me, I, I took several people with me, but the team who was coming in behind me, they sent me a picture today, and there was about six cases left in the corner, and that was it. All of them will have been distributed. You know, I was doing some, you would say, why the Olympics? And I'm, I'm already cut into my time here, but I think this is important. You'd say, why the Olympics? You know, I begin to think about this. I began to think about the first missionary movement that we read of in the Scriptures. The first missionary movement that we read of in the Scriptures would be, uh, would be the day of Pentecost. When people came and the, the feast of Pentecost that was transpiring at that time, people were coming from all over the known world at that time. We know that they spoke many different languages, correct? We know there was a diverse group, but they were all coming where? to one location, right? And we know this, that when the Holy Spirit of God was there and was working through the man of God who was there, that when the Gospel was presented, the Scripture tells us what? That they heard everyone in their own, their own language, their own tongue, right? So you would say, why the Olympics? I think it's a model that was set forth by God in missions from the beginning. Here we see an event where all the world is coming together at one location, right? People that will be represented from almost all nations of the world will come together. And here we had scriptures in over 25 different languages. And those who came, many had the opportunity to hear in their own language. You see, folks, it's strategic. We didn't go to the Olympics because of the excitement of the Olympics. Although it's an exciting thing. You know what? I love sports. I love my country. You put the two of those things together, I really like it. I enjoy it. But you know what? Greater than that was the opportunity we had to go out and put the Word of God into people's hands. As fast as we could take it out of the boxes, they were taking it. Eight of us were distributing scriptures at the rate of about 5,000 every hour that we could get out while we were there. We were down by the Olympic venues. We were down by the Olympic torch in these different areas. Uh, Copacabana Beach, which is a big tourist area. And people would come up. Oh, can I get another one of those for my friend? Or, or oh, uh, I saw you giving those out, and they'd want to receive those. So we get used to the reception. Maybe sometimes we get here in the States. But I can tell you, there's people around the world who have a hunger and a desire to have the Word of God. And that's what the ministry of Bearing Precious Seed exists for, to get the Word of God to those who so desperately need it. You know, I think about many there in Rio. We've already got, there's a website there was a website um, on the cover of the John and Romans. And just after the first couple days, I, I checked the analytics on the website, and it told us that already 11 people from Iraq alone had visited the website that would give them the gospel where they could read more, where they could have their questions answered. 
We had people from all over emailing, asking questions. Where could they get Bibles like those? Over t- in just the first couple days of distribution, people from, from it was either 10 or 11 different countries had already visited the website. That means they had already received one, made their way back home, and from their home country accessed the website to get more information about the gospel. You know, in the world we live in today, we have a lot of tools that we can use. There's a lot of opportunity that's there. We've got to be willing when the opportunity is there to act and be faithful with what God has entrusted to us. He tells us that he put us in trust with the gospel. You know, when he left here, he tells us he left something to our trust. And what he left us was the gospel. And that's our opportunity to get it to those who need it. I think of my grandfather who passed away. And when he passed away, before he passed away, he set up, guess what? A trust. And that trust was for the purpose of the things that were most important to him in this world that he would entrust them to the people that he thought would steward them the best. You know what the Bible tells us? That that's what Jesus Christ did when he left this earth. He took his word and he put it in trust to those who have the responsibility to steward it. You know who that is? It's his church. That's us. It's our responsibility and we have the privilege as missionaries and as a family to do that on a daily basis. And we have the privilege and opportunity to do that because of churches like yours that we have the opportunity to partner with. So when I tell you what's going on in Sierra Leone, those are just a few things that are going on right now. When I tell you about what's going on in Sierra Leone and what the Lord's doing there, when I tell you about what's going on in Rio and how the Lord's blessing that campaign and that project. I can tell you about the project that just happened in Guyana, the one that just happened in Italy. Those are all projects that it's fruit that's going to abound to your account because of your faithfulness in helping and supporting missions in our family. And we thank you so, so very much for it. 2 Kings chapter number 22 is where we're going to be. 2 Kings chapter number 22. I'm going to read a a text. When I first came into the ministry of bearing precious seed, there was a text, and this is it, that that the Lord gave me, and I always felt as if I would preach from this text. And I always felt as if this was something that God would allow me to use. And It's not only been after almost 12 years now in the ministry of bearing precious seed. In those 12 years, just recently, the Lord has given me peace about this message that He's allowed me to preach from 2 Kings chapter number 22. Now, if I get a little confused this evening, you've got you've to be patient with me. When I left Brazil, everything made it back, except I had two suitcases. One suitcase had all of my dirty clothes in it. The other suitcase had my garment bag, my suit, a couple ties. It had uh, some... Um, some things I had bought for my wife and son while we were there. It had uh, some of my dress shoes. And then it had my Bible. And it had, along with it, about 15 years worth of sermons and notes and studying since I've been in the ministry. And guess which bag made it back to the United States of America was my dirty clothes. So I got plenty of dirty socks, although my wife has washed those for me now. Thank you, sweetheart, for doing that. But the other bag has not made it yet, and they say that they have no idea where it's at. So I'm preaching uh, from a new Bible, and the page is hard to even, you know when you get a new Bible and the, the, the gilding on the outside, the pages still kind of even stick together a little bit, and you're you know where your notes are at. You know everything is at. So if I get confused, uh, just be patient with me this evening. And if you would do me a favor, if you would pray that that suitcase would make its way back. You know, everything in there is replaceable. You know, some of those souvenirs I got from the Olympics from my wife and son are kind of once-in-a-lifetime things that I can't really replace. But even those, really, you can put a monetary value on that. And I'm going to tell them exactly how much I think it's worth, trust me. But you know what? The Bible and the notes... That's something I can't put a price on. If I were to lose that, to me, it's priceless. If you would pray that uh, they would be able to find that and it would get it back, I don't care if the other stuff is gone. 
But somehow if I could get that Bible and those notes back would, would mean a lot. 2 Kings chapter number 22. I'm going to start reading in verse number 3. It says, And it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshuthalam, the scribe to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people, and let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord, and let them give it to the doers of the work which is in the house of the Lord to repair the breaches of the house, unto carpenters and builders and masons, and to buy timber and hewn stones to repair the house. Howbeit there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered into the hand, because they dealt faithfully. Verse number 8. And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money which was found in the house and have delivered it under the hand of them that do the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the high priest hath delivered unto me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king, and it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he read in his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Iacham the son of Shaphan, and Akbor the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Azahiah the servant of the kings, saying, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me. This evening, I want to take my text from verse number 8. It says, And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book. I want to preach a message this evening I've entitled, I have found the book. Let's pray. Lord, this evening, I thank you for your word and the power that's contained in it. Lord, as it's preached this evening, may folks look past Phil Taylor to see your most righteous and holy son. Lord, I pray that you'd give me the words to say. Lord, I pray that each one of us tonight would leave this place different than when we came, changed by the power of your word, conformed more to the image of your son. I ask these things in your name, I pray. And I love you, Lord. Amen. Not long ago, I was moving offices at the, uh, it was a couple of years ago. Um, I actually... Um, uh, they did some rearranging, and I think this probably happened since I was here last, but I've actually, they asked me to take over the directorship of the seed line part of Bearing Precious Seed. And so I was moving offices, and while I was, I had a lot of books and things and boxes, and I was moving them, and I, I still had some things, some of you parents can probably relate to this, I still had some things at my parents' house, and my mom had begged me on many occasions to get those things out of her house, but yet they remained there in my old room. Any parents can uh, relate to that. Your uh, children have things that never left. My mom still reminds me that I have things there at the house, and I remind her that I'm probably never going to get them. But I had some books and some things from college, and I had some more room in the office, and I wanted to, those were books I always wanted to have with me, but I didn't have room to, to put them up. So I, Sarah was going to pick some of those things up for me, and I, I asked her, I said, Sarah, there's one thing that I've been looking for. There's a little red New Testament. If you ever come across that in any of the books, bring it with you. It's really important to me. And you know, that day she called me, and she could have said the very words really just read in our text. She might as well have called and said, Phil, I found the book. And you know what? It wouldn't, it wouldn't look like much to most people. In fact, it's kind of Pastor, it's kind, of, um, it's kind of tattered. It's kind of worn. This is a little New Testament. And when you open it up right here in the front, it says, uh, Phil Taylor. Actually, it says Philip Taylor. Nobody calls me that anymore except my mother. It says, Philip Taylor, four years old. This is the first Bible that I ever had. I could take you to the Sunday school room that I was in. I can still see the stack. I was promoting out of the nursery into the four and five-year-olds. 
And our pastor, Dr. Keene, wanted to make sure that everybody, when they came to Sunday school, had a Bible. And I can still, you say, you remember that at four years old? Absolutely. I remember that stack of little red New Testament sitting back there. And they made sure that every one of us got one. That was 31 years ago. I still have it today. It's, not, uh, it's a little wore out. I don't know if it was wore out uh, from uh, overuse, but maybe over abuse uh, when I was young. But you know what? This means a lot to me, this book, this Bible. When I thought about it and I looked at this text, we're going to see this nation, this nation of Judah, and this nation was changed and impacted because of one thing. Not because of the wisdom. We're going to come back to that. I'm going to set that right up there. They were not changed because of the wisdom of the leadership that they had. They weren't changed because a new political party came on the scene. They weren't changed for any reason except what we're going to see this evening because one day they decided to return to what should have always held a place of prominence in their lives. One day they found the book. When they found the book, it wasn't just any other book. It wasn't a book of fairy tales. It wasn't a book of information. It wasn't a set of encyclopedias. It wasn't a book that had been written by any man. But when they found the book, at this time, we could look back and it was probably at that time one of, if not the only copy they had of the law that had been carried across with the tabernacle when they came across. But yet, in the house of the Lord... The statement had to be made, Pastor, that they had to find the book. Now, logical conclusion would have to lead us to understanding that if they found the book, the book had been what? It had been lost. What a sad situation that they didn't even know where their copy of the Word of God is. But this evening, that can I tell us? As a nation, as a world, as families, as individuals, as churches, the question I want us to ask ourselves this evening is this, do we once again, just as the nation of Judah, is it time that we found the book? Is it time that we return to that which we used to place great value on? You say, well, I'm a Christian. I... I, I still place great value on the Word of God. When was the last time that you read it? When was the last time you shared it with somebody else? This evening, I want us to look at three things that they found when they found the book. When they found the book, number one, I want us to understand this. Let's read in verse number five. Now, we know that Shaphan was sent with very clear direction, right? He was to do one thing, to sum the silver and to make sure that it was being dealt with and and that it was being divvied out correctly. Is that what the text tells us? I want us to understand that. Verse number 5, And let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord, speaking of the money, and let them give it to the doers of the work which are in the house of the Lord. They were repairing the temple at that time. They were repairing the house of the Lord under carpenters and builders and masons to buy timber and hewn stones to repair the house. Howbeit there was no reckoning made with them of the money. But then in verse number 8, it tells us that Helkiah says that they found the book. He was sent with a very clear task. From our text this evening, would somebody tell me how much money had been gathered up for the repairs of the house of the Lord? How much? We don't know, do we? Somebody tell me how much was distributed to the carpenters? How much did they need for the hewn stones? We're not given any of that information, are we? The first thing I want us to understand this evening is this. When they found the book, they found something that was of great value. It's almost as if Shaphan comes in and he asks Hilkiah what's been done with the finances and how much has come in. And Hilkiah, if we could paraphrase it this evening, he almost says this. Everything with the finances is fine. Don't worry about that. It's all been dealt with faithfully is the words that he uses. He says, but look, he said, I found something that's of more value than any hoon stones or any timbers or any work or any labor or any amount of silver. He said, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. 
that day they realized they had found something that was of great value. I can think of Paul's letter to Timothy. He tells us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is what? And is profitable. It has value. Second Corinthians chapter number 6 tells us, speaking of the Gospel, that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. When you look at that word treasure, it actually carries out two means, two connotations. It actually means the treasure itself, but it also means, guess what? The coffers that contain the treasure. You know what? In my life, one day I found the book. And after that, I was never the same. But when I found it, I found all the treasure in the world and I found the coffers that contain all the treasures in the world all in one when I found the book. What I'm asking you this evening is, as a family, you know, I've seen several young couples holding little babies, a couple different ones. Some appear to be just days or weeks old. As a family, you know what you need? You need the book. You want to you want to raise a family that serves God? You need to find the book. The word of God. That's what can make a difference in your lives. That's what can make a difference for your family. You know, I can't help but think of losing that Bible, pastor. You know what I had in that Bible? And I'd look at them often. I had these little slips of paper. I think they were from probably 2011 when I was in El Paso, Texas. And I preached to some groups that were down there. And some of the folks who were in this room were there. And I preached a message entitled, Keep on Dreaming. And several people wrote down on a piece of paper some things that God had given them that they were dreaming would be accomplished in their lives. And I had taken those and I had put them into my Bible. And every once in a while I would go over and I would read those and I would pray about those. There was, those are in that Bible that I lost. But you know what? You know one distinctive one that I remember reading in there? It was from a father. And most of them didn't have any names on it. But he said, I dreamed that I could raise a family and my children that would serve God. You know how you can do that? The only way? And there's a lot of parenting books out there. I tell you all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, you read all kinds of stuff, you think, what in the world? I'm glad my parents didn't do that. And every, but for every opinion somebody's got, somebody's got an opinion that contradicts it. But I tell you, we've got a book that's filled with more than just opinions. The very Word of God that gives you the foundation for how you could raise a family. I tell you, you could take every book that's ever been printed or published in the world and pile it on this platform if we could this evening, but at the very top you could take just the very few, very few first words of this book that God Himself wrote in the beginning, and it would sit just those words on the top of anything that man has ever written. When they found the book, they found something that was of great value. You know, we place value on a lot of things in our world today that really are valueless. I think of some of the things in my own life that I place value or importance on. Sometimes we see value as only that which we assign a monetary value to. But you know what? The things that take our time are things that we see as having value. I think of some of the things I allow to take up my time and I think, well, that's, that's ridiculous. But you know what this evening? You know the Apostle Paul makes a warning? And I think some of us would say, well, we know this. We understand this. The Apostle Paul makes a warning and he says this. He says, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again the first principles and oracles of God. You know what he says? He's saying, you know what? You've been saved long enough that you should be able to teach others. But because you've not taken it in for yourself, you've really reverted. And you really need to be taught the very basic principles again. And I hate to say that, but that's sometimes where I find myself. I hate to say it, but the church today as a whole, I think that's probably where we're at. Most of us think, oh, I've been saved, now I've got it figured out, everything's okay. When they found the book, they found something that was of great value. Let's keep on reading. Second thing they found. Okay, we've got to get with it. 
Let's read in 2 Kings. Well, we're not going to read there. For sake of time, I'm going to tell you about it. In 2 Kings chapter number 21, if we had time to research it out, we would find out that Josiah had a grandfather by the name of Manasseh, and he had a father by the name of Ammon, who were both kings before him. And the Bible records that they were some of the most wicked kings that Judah ever had, and they did not follow after God, and they did not do that which was pleasing in the sight of God, and they did not honor God, and their nation did not honor God, and a large part due to the leadership that had been put, that had been put in place. But then we could go to 2 Kings chapter. So we're looking at a grandfather. We're looking at a father. Now we're looking one generation later in 2 Kings chapter number 23. And let's start reading in verse number 22. It says, now this is talking one generation later. After these, which the Scriptures tells us, did not follow God. You know, often we say that somebody is a victim of their upbringing. Often I look at someone and say, do they even have a chance? Do they even have an opportunity to break the cycle of the culture that they've been raised in? They've been raised in sin. They've been raised in seeing alcohol and drugs and prostitution and all these things that are running rampant in our world today. And you wonder, do they have an opportunity Here we're going to see somebody who one generation after a father who would not follow God was able to break the chain and was able to see a difference. Verse 22 says, Surely there was not holding such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in the days of the kings of Israel, nor the kings of Judah, but in the 18th year of King Josiah. Now if we were to go back to chapter number 22, we would find out that in the 18th year something happened. It said in the 18th year of the rule of King Josiah, it says that they found the book. So we could say that in the 18th year a transition was made and something happened and the only thing that's recorded that happened was that they found the book of the law in the 18th year of his reign. But in the 18th year of the king Josiah, wherein the Passover was holding the Lord in Jerusalem, moreover the workers with familiar spirits, and it talks about all those, um, uh, the wicked things that he got rid of, and it says, and like unto him, verse 25, and like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart, and with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him, notwithstanding the Lord turned not from the fierceness of His great wrath. It says, not before Him was there one that followed God, and not did one come after Him that followed God like He did, one generation removed. Not only when they found the book did they find something of great value, but when they found the book, church, they found a great transformation. I believe as Christians we often focus on the problem instead of the solution. I think often we would say, and I've been guilty of this myself, I'd say to my wife, what world is going to be left for our son Hudson to be, to be raised in and to live in? Many of you might have had the thoughts, for our grandchildren, what kind of America is going to be left? And it's almost like we sit back and we say, woe is me, there's no hope, and the world has gone to pot, and there's no hope for America, and there's no hope for the world, and it's too late, and there's nothing that we can do. But can I tell you, it was, uh, it was Ronald Reagan that said that freedom and liberty is never more than one generation away from extinction. And if that is true, the same could be said that the restoration of freedom and liberty is never more than one generation away from being restored to a nation. I believe that we could apply that same understanding to the spiritual state of a nation, a family, an individual, or the world, that never more than one generation, and that in the grace of God, never more than one moment away from spiritual restoration. As an individual, the Scripture in 1 John tells us that if we have sin in our life and we need to return to the Word of God and we need to put the Word of God back in the appropriate place in our lives and we need to have a spiritual restoration, we're nev- you are never more than one moment away from the forgiveness of God in your life. Well, we would say it's too far gone and God says it's too close. Just reach out and take it. Just trust me. Just listen to me. Just follow me. If you want an America and a world that you'd be proud for your children to be raised in, then the opportunity is now to make a difference. And I tell you, the solution for America is not going to come from the White House. It's not going to come from the courthouse or even the state house. The solution for America is going to come from the church house. 
when God's people decide to get active, not active in politics, but get active in the things of God. I don't think there's anything wrong with being active in politics. Don't misunderstand me. What I'm saying is we focus many times on the wrong thing. We should not be surprised that we live in a sinful world. We shouldn't be surprised. You know, sin is nothing new to God. And Judah at this time was living in horrible sin. But look at this. And this is terrific. I'm going to run out of time. I'm probably going to go a few minutes over. Chapter 23, verse number 1. It says, And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah of Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord. And all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests, and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. Verse number 3 says, And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord. You know, to stand by a pillar, sometimes we just read over a passage sometimes, but that statement that it says that he stood by a pillar, that was an act for leadership to make a covenant, a commitment, or a promise to the people is when they stood by the pillar. That's what that statement means. That he would live and follow the words of that book that they found. And follow after the Lord. You know what we need in our nation, in our leadership, in our families, for fathers and mothers and children who are going to stand by a pillar. Say, I'm going to make a covenant on this day. You know what? Yesterday, I can't be responsible for. I can't change what happened yesterday. But I can change what happens tomorrow. I can change what happens right now. This evening, I think that some of you need to come and bow at an old-fashioned altar and say, I'm going to stand by a pillar. I'm going to make a covenant to follow after that book for my family, and for my grandkids, and for my church, and for my country. To follow after the ways of the Lord. We could go through and we could, I'd encourage you to study out chapters number 21, 22, and 23. But after they find the book, you know what they do? They go through and they tear down all the places of false worship. All the high places. There was a, we don't have time to get into it, but there was uh, acts of sodomy that were being included in worship. And that was done away with. You think our country is bad, and it is. But sin and immorality is nothing new to God. And He's dealt with it before, and He's restored people and countries and nations and families out of it before, and He's ready and willing to do it again. When they found the book, they found something of great value. When they found the book, they found a great transformation. And in three minutes, we're going to get this last one. When they found the book, you know, it's quite interesting if you read in chapter number 22, it says that, she, or that Hilkiah found the book, and when he found it, guess what he did? He read it. That's the key. And when he read it, guess what he did? He gave it to Shaphan. And when Shaphan got it, guess what he did? He read it. And when he read it, guess what he did? He gave it to the king. And when the king got it, guess what he did? And they catch on really fast, Pastor. They read it. And when they read it, when the king read it, he ran his clothes, and guess what he realized? That other people needed to hear it. So he gathered together everybody in all of Judah, and he read it to them. You know what's one great thing about the gospel and the word of God? It's self-perpetuating. When you get it and you read it, and it changes your life, and you're gloriously saved then you realize that through the very book that brought you to salvation, that it's now your responsibility to make sure that somebody else has it. So when Hilkiah read it, he realized he couldn't keep it to himself, and he gave it to Shaphan, and Shaphan read it, and he realized he couldn't keep it to himself, so he gave it to the king. And the king read it, and he realized he couldn't keep it to himself, so he gave it to the rest of the people. So the question that lingers this evening would be this. If it's changed your life and if you've been gloriously saved, who else has it because one day you got it? The gospel is self-perpetuating. The very book that brings us to salvation is the very one that teaches us through the influence of the Holy Spirit that we're to give it to others. 
Well, I guess we could look at about 8,000 more people who are going to have it. Why would we do this? Why would we put together these scriptures to give out at the parade? Do you know why? Because one day your life was changed and you realize that the same power that changed your life is the same power that's available to change somebody else's life. So out of responsibility to the very book that brought you to salvation, we're going to make sure that other people have it. Because one day we found the book, we want to make sure that somebody else finds it. You know, I thought about things that I found when I found the book. You know, when I found the book, I found salvation. When I found the book, I found eternal life. When I found the book, I found a new way of living. I found a new home, a new eternity, a new destiny. I, knew, I found a new real purpose for my life when I found the book. When I found the book, I found a lot of things, but I can tell you, there's a lot of people who have not found it yet. And it's our responsibility to make sure that they get it. I told you we'd come back. I'm closing my Bible. I'm done, I promise. I told you we'd come back to this, this little red New Testament. I told you that when you opened it up, it says something on the inside. It says, Philip Taylor, four years old, and it does. It also says something else in there that I didn't tell you. It says, printed by, bearing precious seed, First Baptist Church, Milford, Ohio. My first Bible was a bearing precious seed Bible. I want you to follow me. I got this about 31 years ago. Probably 30 years before that, a young man went to Sunday school for the very first time. When he did, he sat down, and everybody who was there had a Bible. The boy next to him had, remember those ones that had the, the zipper on it and had the cross hanging off of it? He had one like that. That little boy, this is a true story, went home that day. And for the next couple days, he walked up and down the streets of his little town, and he picked up scrap metal along the side of the road. He took that in, traded it in, and got some money. I can picture in my mind him going back to that same church the way that he tells it. They had a little bookstore. And I can imagine a handful of change and maybe a few bills he lays out on the counter. He says, I want a Bible. And they said, well, what kind of Bible do you want? Probably had doubtless some different sizes, some different colors. He says by his own testimony, he didn't know what to say, Pastor. So he just said, well, I'd, I'd like to have one with a zipper on it. And that day he got his first Bible. That little boy's name was Dr. Charles Keene. And I thought about this. That Bible changed his life. And in it, he learned that he was a sinner. And one day, he was gloriously saved. And when he found the book that day, he did find something of great value. He did find a great transformation. But he also found what we talked about. He found a great responsibility. Think about he picked up scrap metal on the side of the road to get his first Bible. And out of obedience to it, after being saved, he got a heart to get the Word of God to other people. And today, as the founder of Bearing Precious Seed, because he got one, 150 million plus Bibles have been printed and sent out around the world. All because that one day he got his first. And I don't know where all, they have, all of those Bibles have gone, but can I tell you, I know where one of them went. I got it. Because you know what? When I promoted from the nursery into Sunday school, I had a pastor, Dr. Charles Keene, who wanted to make sure that anybody that came to Sunday school had a Bible. That they didn't have to go and pick up scrap metal on the side of the road to get one. But that one was available to him. You know what, that's pretty personal to me. Because he found the book, one day I found the book, and 150 million plus more found the book. And before us is represented about 8,000 people who are going to get a copy of God's Word. 
I want you to think about this. If out of that one copy that he picked up scrap on the side of the road to be able to get, out of that one came 150 million more. What can God do with these 8,000? You know, we often, Pastor, we like to identify one Bible with one person. We look at this one and we say, this is the one that Phil Taylor got. And that, I, that's exciting. Or we think about one person in Africa or Brazil or the Philippines. And we like this. We put out posters that have a picture of this little weeping child holding their Bible. You know why? Because we want people to give so that we can print more of them. And we love that. And we like to identify a Bible with a person. But guess what? We don't ever know how many lives could be touched by just one of these. When they found the book, they found something of great value. When they found the book, they found a great transformation. When they found the book, they found a great responsibility. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. Lord, as pastor comes, I pray that you would work in the hearts and lives of each individual who's here. Lord, I know we've gone maybe a little longer than usual, and we're still going to do the dedication prayer over the Scriptures, Lord, but I pray that people would be open to your Spirit and to your Word, Lord, and that you would do a work in their hearts and lives. Lord, as the pastor closes the service as he sees fit, Lord, might I be willing to change. Let us not look at others. Lord, for families, for fathers, for grandparents, for boys and girls, for teenagers, for pastors and missionaries. This evening, might we examine our own lives and ask, do we need to return to the Word of God and once again find it in our lives and restore it to the place of prominence that it deserves? Lord, and might we be open and willing to the great responsibility that it gives us to share it with others. I ask this in your name, I pray. I love you, Lord. Amen. With your heads bowed for a moment, go ahead and stand to your feet if you would please. As you stand, I'm going to have Lisa play the invitation. As she plays tonight, I believe God's spoken to your heart. I want you to respond to him this evening. Put the word of God in the right place in your life. If God's spoken to your heart, respond to him tonight. Will you please? The altar's open for you to come. That's right. That's right. Amen. Who's received the word because you received the word? It transformed your life. You got away from the book and you'd have to say, I found the book. Respond to what the Lord's told you to do. That's right. Amen.
right. Go ahead and be seated for a minute, if you would. And, uh, you know, God told Joshua when he took over from Moses, it's this book of the law that shall not depart out of thy mouth. And you meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according that's written therein. Then thou shalt have, then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and thou shalt have good what? Success. Only time success mentioned in the Bible. Psalm 1, Christian. You don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scornful. Your delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Uh, that's what we've got to get back to again. Our churches have gotten into psychology and happiness and music and very little word of God. Time to get back to the book. Amen. Amen. Great message. Man, I enjoyed that. You could have preached all night as far as I'm concerned. I thought he would. He was going to. He had he had a mellow yellow for dinner tonight, which is equivalent to Mountain Dew. I said, "Oh, great! We're going to be at around nine thirty to ten o'clock tonight." You know, he wired up, man. But uh, I love that message. That was great. Could have listened to that for a long time. Well, brother uh, Taylor, we want to dedicate these scriptures. You want to come and tell us what it is that you do when you do that, and uh, we'll let you handle that. You know, it's interesting the pastor brought up Joshua because. I didn't have time to get into it, but the, many historians would believe that the very copy that had been carried across right before the death of Moses, God asked Moses to make a copy of the law and to write it down so that they would have it preserved for the next generations. And it was of such importance, and God placed such an importance on it, that Moses conveyed that importance then to uh, Joshua, who took over, and then many believe that that was the exact copy, the one that says was put in the side of the ark there in the Holy of Holies that they found there uh, in the house of God. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly, I know that this evening I'm at a church that loves the Word of God and that wants to see other people have it. And I wouldn't, I would not deny the fact that this church loves it, but my challenge this evening is this. How much do we love it? Could we love it more? Could we be more committed to it? And I believe that I could, and I know that I could, and uh, I was challenged by the Word of God this evening. I pray that you were. This time what we're going to do is have a time of dedication. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask anybody who's capable or able to come up and kneel down. Let's get our hands on these boxes, and we're going to pray over them. Come on ahead if you can come. Come now. You say, well, I didn't get to work on them. We understand not everybody could fit it into your schedule, okay? That's fine, but here's a way that you can be involved right now. Is to come. I'm going to ask somebody, uh, and I don't believe there's anybody in this room that loves the Word of God and loves the ministry of bearing precious seed more than this person. And I'm going to ask Brother Jack Jarvis to come and to pray. While all of us are praying as individuals, that uh, he's going to pray audibly out loud for all of us for these scriptures. They would find their way to the person that needs them, and that God would use them in a great, mighty way. If you can get up around the boxes, if you can't get to one of the boxes. Maybe just put your hand on the shoulder of somebody in front of you who, uh, who has their hands on one of the boxes. I want to be clear, putting our hands on these boxes doesn't bless them. God already blessed his word. <laughs> All we're doing is praying that God will use these scriptures and knowing in faith that uh, his promise, that his word won't return void, will be a reality with these scriptures. Dear Lord in heaven, God, we love you so much and we thank you for the privilege we have to be able to, to just touch your word. God, we put these Bibles together. Uh, Lord, you know the destination of each one. We know that each one of these Bibles will put into, be put into someone's hands. And God, we pray that you would guide that Bible to that person, that their heart would be touched, that the life would be changed, that the people around them would be changed. Lord, we know, as Phil said, there's so many things this Bible self-perpetually. Lord, we, we pray that this Bible would go, each one of them, to where you would have them to go. Lord, it was such a blessing, and, and Lord, I, I believe when we get to glory, you're going to tell us where all these went, and we'll know the history of each one. God, thank you for that. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for this privilege we had to put your word together. Uh, Lord, you, you are a good God. You do good things. It is a blessing to each one of us to be a part of this. Thank you, Lord, and we thank you for what you are going to do. In Jesus' dear name we pray. Amen. Amen. One more. One more thing. There's one more opportunity to get involved and help. 
We need four to six capable men who would volunteer to help. Brother Tyler is going to oversee the loading of the trailer. I'm going to pull the trailer around behind the fellowship hall, and we've got just the equipment to load up. It won't take long. Can I get four, five, six guys who raise your hand and say you'd be willing to take Hopefully another extra 10, 15 minutes? Yes, if you've got a commitment in the choir, we, we understand that. But there's some, I see several hands. Meet Brother Tyler in the fellowship hall, and he'll help you uh, and show you what we need to do and get everything loaded into the trailer. That's Pastor. right. Yellow. All right. Where's the police over there? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and you to your seat here. While you're going back, let's sing Higher Ground, all right? I'm pressing. Hey, this is Higher Ground right here. Amen. Amen. I'm pressing on the upward way. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet higher ground. Sing it. Me up and let me send my faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. God bless you. You're dismissed. Fellas, you go.